Debunking Myths, created by Chrissy Lockery. Assignment Details For this assignment, students were given the option to choose between two topics. Based on the choice I selected, students are asked to select one myth and clearly identify what is known to be accurate and inaccurate about that idea. Tie this to your reading about how people learn and how neuroscience or cognitive science concepts have been appropriated for educational use. The truth behind MTBIs. The myths analyzed in this presentation are centered around the facts and fallacies behind mild traumatic brain injuries. The information is drawn from the article, Myth and Facts About Traumatic Brain Injury, posted by the Valletta and Company Law Firm. The purpose of the article is to bring to light the misconceptions that many people believe to be true about mild traumatic brain injuries. For example, that a mild brain injury does not sustain lifelong effects on the brain. In the text, the firm states that the vast majority of brain injuries are initially diagnosed as mild. Until recently, most doctors, personal injury lawyers, and crash victims knew very little about the long-term consequences of mild traumatic brain injuries. Subtle but permanent changes in intellect, cognition, emotion, memory, concentration, and personality were blamed on everything but the MTBI which initiated the changes. Some injuries diagnosed as mild might actually be much more severe or have the potential to transpire into a worsening condition over time. Misconceptions about MTBIs There are five myths about traumatic brain injury that need to be reconciled according to the article. These myths will be outlined below and then described further on the following slides. Number one, a person must be knocked out or lose consciousness to suffer a brain injury. Number two, a person must strike his head on something to sustain a traumatic brain injury. Number three, minor head injuries such as whiplash or concussions in sports are purely transitory events and cannot cause long-term disability. Number four, people who complain of long-term consequences after minor head injuries are mostly malingers and hypochondriacs. And number five, there are no objective evidence that mild traumatic brain injury and long-term complications such as post-concussion syndrome even exist. Truths about MTBIs. So the truth to myth number one. This is false. As evidence, the article cites a well-known case about a man by the name of Phineas Gage. Mr. Gage was a railway worker who suffered a detrimental frontal lobe injury when an explosion drove a long iron bar into his head. According to reports, the bar entered through Gage's lower left cheek and exited out the top of his skull. Mr. Gage was awake and able to sit and hold a conversation with some work friends while waiting for the first responders to arrive. Although he claimed to make a full recovery, he experienced significant deviations in his personality and behavior. These changes cost him his career, family, and emotional well-being. Myth number two. This is also untrue. The previous situation with Phineas Gage, as well as other examples including shaken baby syndrome and severe whiplash can all cause the brain to strike the insides of the skull. This jostling of the brain can lead to bruising and shearing injuries, mostly to the frontal lobes. About MTBIs continued. Myth number three. This is a fallacy. The brain is delicate. Even minor head traumas can lead to lifetime permanent deficits. The article states that this is particularly true where there have been significant acceleration or deceleration of the head, whiplash and shaken babies. Myth number four is another misconception. According to the firm's data, it is estimated that as many as 10 to 15% of a person who suffers a concussion may have long-term changes affecting cognition, intellect, emotions, and personality. These symptoms are a result of the injury over time, so they are often overlooked or misdiagnosed despite the plethora of evidence at the scene of the accident. This, is, this evidence is usually in the form of concussions, shock, disorientation, post-traumatic amnesia, or even loss of consciousness. Truths continued. Myth number five. This is also incorrect. Positron emission tomography scans which are PET scans, as well as magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, are two techniques used by medical professionals to identify the lesions associated with MTBIs. 
Aside from this, neuropsychological testing can determine if there are any understated cognitive, emotional, intellectual, and personality changes due to an MTBI. Connections to how we learn. In Benedict Carey's novel, How We Learn, the first chapter is dedicated to providing the reader with a basic understanding of the brain and its intense, intricate functions. It is here that Carey describes the brain. The average human brain contains one billion neurons. Most of these cells link to thousands of other neurons, forming a universe of intertwining networks that communicate in a ceaseless, silent electrical storm with a storage capacity, in digital terms, of a million gigabytes. It is easy to discern from this quote that the brain is the central hub for the human body. It tells us what to do, where to go, what to say, what to feel, along with everything else. One connection to be made between traumatic brain injuries and the information found in how we learn is the understanding that without the brain, the body is just an empty shell. You cannot alter the brain without it having an outward effect on the body. This was learned after reading about Henry Moliason and his severe seizures. Moliason, looking for relief, enlisted the help of a surgeon who decided to remove two of his lobes. Without these crucial pieces of brain, Moliason lost the ability to create new memories. What's important for us to remember is that any change to our brain, big or small, is going to alter some aspect of our being, whether it's our personality, intelligence, or emotional state. Connections to Neuroeducation the influences between MTBIs and neuroeducation are very similar to the connections made with Carey's How We Learn. To start, neuroeducation provides an understanding of the workings of the brain. In the hopes of bridging the gap between teaching and neuroscience, neuroeducation helps guide educators by providing updated information on neuroscience practices that could be beneficial to pedagogy. Hook and Farah also say that such research provides a scientific context within which to understand student learning and in the not too distant future might enhance the assessment of readiness to learn or special needs. It could be argued that neuroeducation might benefit students with special needs, including students who suffer from traumatic brain injuries. These strategies will be created by scientists and educators who are using a growing and developing brain as their inspiration and guide. Currently, it is important to note that evidence indicates that educators use neuroscience to maintain patience, optimism, and professionalism with their students, to increase their credibility with colleagues and parents, and to reinforce their sense of education as a profession concerned with shaping students' brain development. Benedict Carey, How We Learn. C.J. Hook and M.J. Farah, Neuroscience for Educators, What Are They Seeking and What Are They Finding? Valletta and Company, Myths and Facts About Traumatic Brain Injury.